Like a lot of delusional teenagers, I was desperate to uh, run off and join a commune. And when the Manson family started hitting the newspaper, I thought they looked awfully cool. So I uh, set about going out to California and hanging out with them. When I was born, my mother uh, decided to name me Susan, after uh, supposedly after her favorite uh, voice teacher. Obviously, I was born female, and uh, but never felt it at all. I mean, me and my brother were just two little boys. I wasn't into wearing dresses. My mother told me she used to have to chase me around to put a dress on me because I just hated it. And, uh, you know, we're talking baby, we're talking, you know, two years old kind of thing, you know. There was no question in my mind that I wasn't a boy. And um, I had absolutely no interest in anything um, female, anything that was associated with being female. And, you know, I, I loved my Tonka trucks, you know, in America, Tonka trucks are like the... BMW of, of kids, kids' toys. I was born in 1953 in uh, Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City, the year it was completed. The year 1953, two days before 1954, because my parents had already claimed me as a tax exemption. So I had to be born before the first of the year, so. In America, uh, you get tax exemptions on kids. The yearly tax bill through the IRS. My mother had to be induced so I would be born before the first of the year. What about school? Yeah, it was difficult because uh, because it was it was so obvious that I wasn't like most of the other girls and. Uh, you know, and I, I wanted to hang around with the boys more than I wanted to hang around with the girls. The only girls I really hung around with when I was, um, back then, you know, 1960, 1959, 1960, when I started school, uh, most of the girls that I hung around with were the black girls who, who did uh, uh, jump ropes, Back then, uh, girls had to wear dresses to school. It was very oppressive, you know? I mean, you could not choose, you know? And so I went around feeling awkward most of the time at school with the wearing the dresses, but I just kind of eventually tried to forget about it and just get on with things. So I, I you know, I had my scrapes on my legs and my knees and, and everything from, uh, rough housing and, you know, jumping around and climbing things, you know, wearing a dress. But I was a very different teenager, obviously, um, for lots of reasons. It wasn't just my gender. No, I was kicked out of my house uh, when, I, when I was pregnant at 16. And um, so I was kind of on my own from then on. I mean, my mother tried to help in, in the limited way that she knew how. Um, but for the most part, <clears throat> I was never on my own on my own, um, but I was in a relationship when I was probably 18 or 19 <clears throat> when I was living in, in Los Angeles, California as an adult. And um, 
that was uh, my first relationship with uh, with a woman, and we were both about the same age. With my daughter, our, our relationship really started to change because I was anti-money, and my mother was super pro-money. And um, she started flashing the credit cards around, and and my daughter saw how you could get anything you wanted with these little plastic cards, you know. And she started to resent the fact that I didn't have those little plastic cards and that I wasn't interested in having those little plastic cards. How is your relationship right now with her? Well, seeing that she died in 2000 and died, we're a little bit distant. Uh, uh, she ended up with a serious drug problem, as most of America does and with the taking opioids and drugs that she didn't need to take just to get high. Um, and the last probably, I would say, five or six years of her life, she was so addicted that she lost her children. And she was living on the streets at times. And, uh, you know, her life was all about crack cocaine, you know. and. Um, then she started, like I said, she started getting into the prescription drugs because it started getting really easy to find doctors that would prescribe you, you know, uh, painkillers and benzodiazepines and those kind of drugs so the people, junkies could get high legally. Mm. And um, so she got into that whole trap. And between the coke and the, the opioids and everything, um, her life just spun way out of control. There was nothing I could do for her. And she would b battle me. She'd beg for my help and I'd go help her. Um, I don't think anybody in my family was all that surprised uh, when I started transitioning. First of all, they were 3,000 miles away in America, so you know they didn't have to see me or be around me. I started in, in uh, 2007, 2008, started with the uh, gender clinic and uh, doing all the things that I had to do through the gender clinic on my road to uh, transitioning. Um, I didn't go back to America until uh, a friend needed me, um, so I moved back in 2013. What a mess that was. I couldn't wait to get back here. But uh, I did. I, ha I did experience transitioning in both countries, and uh, of course, America, you pay for everything if, if you don't have insurance. <clears throat> now, luckily, because of my income, I was able to get, uh, get uh, uh, what's it called, it Medicaid. There's two different ones, Medicare and Medicaid, and I think it was Medicaid that uh, I got. and. Um, so I was able to get things paid for and stuff, but still it was just a really different situation. Um, well, the real catalyst for a starting transition was the fact that I wasn't being taken seriously as a musician because of my female status. And there's a jazz musician, Billy Tipton, who had the same problem back in the 40s and 50s. And um, so she decided to, you know, go underground and come back out as a man. And, uh, you know, so she started living her, living her life as a man. And suddenly her music was like, you know, thought to be great and wonderful. And she was the best thing in the jazz, but they thought she was male. And so that's what I said to heck with this. I had, absol I had always thought of myself as being more male than female anyway, so let's just do the transition. So yeah, I, and the protocol back then was that you had to be referred to the gender clinic by um, a psychi uh, a, you know, a psychiatrist or somebody in the NHS mental health uh, system. And then once you get the referral, then you, uh, you know, get an appointment with the uh, gender clinic, which everybody, everybody, everybody had total frustration because, of course, suddenly 
the one clinic in all of England that dealt with gender issues was being inundated with thousands of people that suddenly realized that there was a way to get to what they wanted to be. And so uh, a couple of other gender clinics uh, were opened up, uh, one Bristol and a couple of others. And um, <clears throat> uh, so, you, so that's how it starts. And then you ha have to live for an entire year as the, your preferred gender um, before they'll start you on hormones. Or if you're a woman, you have to bind bind yourself up and and uh, wear so-called male clothing, which I did anyway. If you're born male and you want to transition to female, you have to uh, do everything that you can to appear female. So wear dresses and you know high heels and all the stuff that girly girls wear. I'll make up all that kind of stuff. And um, yeah, so you have to live like that for a year. And uh, as much as you can get away with it, use the toilets for that gender. And, and then after that, after about a year, uh, they will start you on the hormones to change you to the, um, the gender that you uh, are wanting to change to. And when you first start taking the, the testosterone, um, you go through a, a, a male adolescence sexual stage. <laughs> we don't need to say anymore. <laughs> yep. Uh, a very uncomfortable, super horny time. <laughs> <laughs> and how did you deal with it? Uh, well, the way most teenage boys deal with it. <laughs> so you, how old were you when you started transitioning? Um, I was, I think I must have been about 40, ooh, I don't know, close to 50. Let's do the math. It so was, you were close to 50 and feeling like a teenage boy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and what happened after, like, how long? I would say that I really started getting muscle, male muscle, and um, all of the body hair and everything, um, probably within, I'd say, nine months or so. You know, I really started to notice a drastic difference. And... Um, you had a change of voice as well. Yes. Yeah. I mean, my, my whole... My, all the males in my family talk like I do, about the same pitch. What would you tell to people who don't get it, like your the whole trans thing? Like <clears throat> some, some people could be say like, well, I'm white, but I feel like a black person. Can I identify as a black male then? Well, I, I think that's an excellent question because uh, the thing that a lot of people that don't understand the whole situation um, is that they think that um, and it, that it's it's absolutely a choice, it, like a choice like deciding whether you want to wear pink fingernail polish or black fingernail polish, or whether you want to have a chocolate cake or a vanilla cake, you know. And it's not a choice like that. It's and the thing is, is that. There, of course, you can't tar everybody with the same brush. You know, you've got people that, especially, it seems like mostly male to females feel really, really strongly when they're transgender. I mean, they don't, they don't want to be thought of as androgynous or in between. They really want to go from having that female, I mean, that male body to having a completely female body. And it's not about um, hairdos and, and makeup and, and that stuff. They just really want that female body because that's the way they feel comfortable. When it comes to being comfortable in your own skin, you know, and you have the opportunity to do that, 
then how does it hurt anybody else? And then there are people like me that have sort of varying reasons for it. Um, I mainly, what really f made me realize that I just couldn't live as a woman anymore <clears throat> after that situation with the band situation was I had humongous tits. And so there was no way for me to get away with, you know, uh, being treated any, any way but a fat girl with big tits. And it was not a comfortable way to be thought of. And it was from the time I was 12 years old, you know. I mean, gender, gender uh, identity really has very little to do with sex or sexuality at all. Because, of course, most of my life, I thought I was a lesbian. And, um, you know, I, I was exclusively with women. And, you know, I was one of those radical lesbians back in the early 70s and during Stonewall and all that. And, um, but <laughs> the funny thing is, is that the minute I started transitioning and taking male hormones, I was no, I, no longer interested in females whatsoever. <laughs> I suddenly, I suddenly, uh, you know, became a, a teenager again, but a male teenager, but my desire was towards males. So uh, that makes things very confusing. my life I've been a musician. I started playing piano when I was about five. My latest guitars, I just bought this one recently. When my aunt moved to Florida from California, we inherited her, her piano. <coughs> so I started playing that and my parents tried to get me um, piano lessons at five, but nobody would take me because I was too young. Um, but they recognized, they, my mother's a musician, so you know, they recognized. I started playing when I was about 11. That was part of my frustration in my teens was that I wanted to be in bands, but I couldn't get anybody to, that was interested in having a female guitarist. Back in those days, they thought that uh, if girls were gonna play guitar, they should play folk music, not rock. So it was very frustrating for me. 
my mother uh, <coughs> was a singer and a um, clarinetist, and she played clarinet in a, a lot of <coughs> bands and orchestras and different things. She was in the musicians' union, so uh, you know she did a lot of freelancing, doing different musical projects and stuff. This 12 string. And then I have this one, which I really love. It's, a, it's, not, it's not any kind of name brand or anything, but it sure sounds nice. And then there's this one. That's a, a vintage uh, Epiphone Sheridan II. It's another jazz guitar, but it's also very popular in the rock world. Which one do you play the most? Mainly I, I play the six string acoustic just because it's easier than. So, uh, <clears throat> I uh, produced this CD uh, around 1997 uh, or so, and uh, some of my earlier stuff. Uh, the name of the project is Virus, and the name of the album is Doomed. And as you can see, it's all pretty gothic, and uh, that's the name of the songs and stuff. It's all my tunes, it's all my stuff. The uh, rock tunes are from when I was with Ged Gidget Goes to Hell, which was my biggest rock project, my biggest rock band. But uh, What is the story of the keyboard? What do you get from <clears throat> Well, I usually have a keyboard so that I can, once, when, I get, when I need to tune my guitar to an ab absolute E, mm -hmm. then I'll use the keyboard to do that. I also sometimes just kind of play chords and stuff and figure out different tunes I'm working on on the piano. Would you call yourself a hoarder or no? No, not really. I mean, I, I hoard guitars, I suppose, but, but the only reason, course. like I said, yeah. the only reason it looks like this is because of the fact that I haven't put my clothes away. But normally those chairs are cleared off and the guitars are put away better. <clears throat> what made me? So how many guitars do you have? Six, seven? Oh god, um, I think I have, let's see, four or five acoustics and five or six, probably about twelve. No, where do you play them? Only at home? You don't go out and play in public? Not really, I'm not really into playing in public anymore. Even like open mic for fun? It, yeah, I like doing open mics and stuff. It's just too hard to carry everything and uh, oh, yeah. have the right equipment. You know, everybody's got like little PA systems now and, you know. It's just like a lot of delusional teenagers, I was desperate to uh, run off and join a commune. And when the Manson family started hitting the newspaper, I thought they looked awfully cool. So I uh, set about going out to California and hanging out with them. In a scene described by one investigator as reminiscent of a weird religious rite, five persons, including actress Sharon Tate, were found dead at the home of Miss Tate and her husband, screen director Roman Poljanski. Miss Tate, who starred in Valley of the Dolls, was eight months pregnant and was found in a bikini-type nightgown with a rope around her neck attached to the body of a man. The killers used Tate's blood to write pig on the front door. A wandering band of members of a so-called religious cult with a leader they call Jesus has had three of its followers arrested in the investigation of the murder of Sharon Tate and six others. But uh, soon after meeting them, I realized that they weren't the cool hippies that uh, 
that they looked like in the newspapers and the magazines. And uh, they ended up having a very racist uh, ideology and they were actually kind of run by uh, the Aryan, the Aryan Brotherhood, which was the uh, Nazi um, prison gang, and um, it's now spilled out into into things like the Oath Keepers and um, Proud Boys and those groups. They they weren't the the sweet hippie kids that were misunderstood. Um, they were a bunch of criminals, and so I got out of that situation. But while I was in it, oh my God, the things that happened! If I had so what, what, you were actually in Manson family, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Like I say, you know, just to kind of paraphrase everything, there's a picture of me that was not a bad picture when I was like twenty, twenty-two, probably. But yeah. Uh, so how old were you when you went to join the Manson? I was uh, 17, well, 16, really. Um, but it was after the murders and when all of the, the uh, newspaper articles were around. And I'm sure I wasn't the only teenager that, that thought that that was cool. Um, not that the murders were cool, but just that the whole group was cool. and. Uh, you know, uh, once I hung out with them for a while and realized what they were all about, you know, I kind of tried to back off and stuff, which was difficult because, like any gang, once you're a member, they don't want you to leave with their secrets, you know. No, they, they didn't even call themselves the Manson family. That was the, the press dubbed them the Manson family. Um, any, any young girl that ended up with that group of people, it was because they were young and naive and middle class and bored. You know, just like I said about my feeling bad about, you know, being a have and feeling bad for the have nots. You know, I was easily manipulated into a situation where, where I wanted to see this group as being one thing when they were actually completely the opposite, you know. And once I started to figure that out and met, met some of their uh, more devious characters, you know, people that were just released from prison or people that escaped from prison, I said, this is, this is not for me, you know. And so, you know, like I said, I started to, to back, backtrack and try to kind of get away from them. Hello. Hello, Susan. Yeah. That's amazing. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have Ta a lovely day. Take care. Bye bye. <laughs> so, is your name still Susan? I think we're doing a porn film. <laughs> <laughs> so, is your name still Susan on an address? My legal name is. Uh, is Susan because of the whole situation with America and my name being I gotta take this one and feed her um, because of the fact that I'm legally Susan Soul in America and if I travel between countries I can't be having to you know explain all that so I just uh, it's too hard to change your name in America so I didn't want to have to deal with that with the, with the passports and all that kind of shit. And I was Edgerton Paul legally here, but when I went back to America, um, I had to change my name back so that I, there wouldn't be a conflict with names. It's like when people call you Susan and they look at your beard. Well, there's no question when the TSA sticks their hand between my leg doing a search. <laughs> so, do you get it now? <laughs> Like I said, I was like 16 or 17, and uh, I was probably 18 or 19 when I just had to get away. 
And the, the thing is, is that if I hadn't, I would have gone up to, we were all living in, um, in like Hollywood. And um, some of them wanted to go up, up north to Stockton, California. And, um, or Sacramento. And I'm glad I didn't go because two of the people that went with them ended up dead. So there was a good possibility that I would have been one of those people that ended up dead. So I worked with the FBI to get out of there. So you, you joined them after the murder? Yeah, it was after the murder. It was, it was when uh, most of them were, were already convicted. Um, but there was, I, I started hanging around with the girls at the corner of, uh, of where the Hall of Justice was. You know, there was this whole gaggle of Manson girls that hung around there um, in protest. I mean, for, for sure, I thought they were innocent. Um, but that was, you know, one of those teenage things where it wasn't because they were really innocent. It was because I wanted them to be innocent. Um, and wanted it to be all a big mistake and everything. And uh, I couldn't imagine a bunch of hippies doing that sort of thing because hippies were all about peace and love. And uh, so, I mean, you know, and, and just being a kid, you romanticize. I mean, every generation ever since, every generation has had a gaggle of kids all over the world who find Charlie Manson online and they they get this fan like you know love for for him like he was just this really you know great guy and he wasn't he was a, a little con man he was very good at it you know he, he managed to uh, take a bunch of, of rich girls and turn them into criminals you know, his, that was his whole thing was, was getting back at middle cl the middle class society. They wouldn't pay his music any attention and uh, used their kids against them. Luckily, no harm came to me. Luckily, you know, I, I saw through it, it all and everything and got out of there. But it's funny because when I, when I had gotten out of it, I still had you know, pictures and stuff. And my brother came out to California and um, I had him take this guitar I had back to, back to Massachusetts with him. And he went through Canada and he got stopped at the border and they confiscated the pictures that I had that were in my guitar case because it was Charlie Manson and, and different people in the you know, and they were photographs. They weren't like cut out of the paper or anything. So the Canadian, <laughs> the Canadian uh, police or border people, you know, harassed my brother about that. But luckily, luckily nothing happened. And they sent him on his merry way. So, but yeah, that's that's one of those things that you do when you're. You think you're an adult, and you think you're all grown up, and you think you know what you want, and you think you know people and how the world works, and you just don't. Well, I'll tell you that uh, when it really hit home for me, what they were all about was, um, first of all, they wanted to use my daughter and me um, to photograph for a Nazi group that they were involved with. And there was just no way that I was gonna have that happen. And, um, you know, so I made excuses and everything not to be involved. That's a picture of me in the, I think I was 12. That's me and my father. That would have been in New York City. Yeah, I was born, obviously, and uh, oh, here's a good one. Here's a picture of 
This is uh, me right here. And uh, that's my brother, Alex. And the other two are neighborhood kids. That was when we lived in Santa Monica, California. That's, uh, that's me before transition, obviously, uh, with my granddaughter. Colleen, who's now an adult and has two babies of her own. I must have been in my 40s. This is all three of my grandchildren when they were, when they were in foster care. This is Colleen, my granddaughter. And this is Connor. This is Connor. And this is Chris. And um, I basically bought Chris up until he was about 10. And then things started getting so much worse with his mother, mother that uh, I had to extract myself some, from the situation. Colleen was adopted by her foster family, as was, as was uh, Connor. So they, they were adopted by really good families um, who we had contact with and everything. So it was, not like we lost contact. Christopher ended up in guardianship with the daughter of Colleen's adoptive mother. Um, her adoptive mother was, uh, was a foster mother for 30 or 40 years, and she often uh, would adopt her foster children, and it wasn't, they weren't pushed out the door at 18. They were uh, put through school, through college and everything. So uh, so she she's the most stable of all of them. And like I said, Chris was with me for the first 10 years of his life. So he was the most stable then. But once he got into guardianship, things started to change for him. Um, and he became kind of a different person. My stepfather, the war hero. <laughs> I can't believe they put that on his head. You can see he's not amused. It's my granddaughter when she was a baby, taking a nap with her doll Elizabeth, which I gave her. Elizabeth went everywhere with her. Then here's a picture of my daughter with my brother. This is my brother, Jonathan. And my daughter, Lisa, having a baby. That was when she was giving birth to my second grandson, Connor. This is a picture of me when I was uh, about 14. And uh, I was desperate to be in the, uh, the Navy. Uh, of course, that wouldn't be the uniform that they would have stuck me in. They would have stuck me in a, a uniform that looked like a stewardess humor, uniform. So, of course, I had to give up on that dream. Uh, this is a real bad picture, but um, this is a picture of me back in the hippie days with my daughter and a puppy. 